feel it down there. It hurts like crazy. I have been speaking and talking. Oh, thank you. I've got, got my halls right here. Uh, my name is Ethan Hale. I'm an author and an illustrator. I draw pictures. I write stories. I do comics. Anybody here a comics reader? Zach Selene. How many people here have read a Hazardous Tales book? Oh, nice. How many people here have read all eight that are out right now? You've read all eight? Nice. If you have not read all of them, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I have a series of graphic novels on American. You can see that I can draw and talk at the same time. It's a very tricky skill. It's taken a lot of practice, a lot of years of doing this to get good at it. But I get messy if people start shouting and talking. If people are causing problems, making noises, the drawings get messy. And I don't want to tell this whole story. It's got some amazing stuff at the beginning, some gross stuff at the end. And I want to get to the end. And you guys are the fifth graders, so you get to hear a little portion that the second and third and fourth graders do not get to hear. In fact, the second graders don't get to hear any of this stuff. The second graders, we spent all our time drawing that goofy monster over there. We're not going to draw a monster. We're going to do an American history story that is weird and gross. But since you guys are in the fifth grade, you can hear my segment that is too violent for the younger grades <laughs> at the beginning. But if I have to keep backing up and fixing things, we will not get to the gross stuff at the end, and we'll have to just end right here. So, please help me out. The louder I have to shout, the faster I'm going to lose my voice. I really want to tell you guys this story. And you want to hear it, because if you're a big fan of Hazardous Tales, this is the only place you can hear this particular story. So, can you keep me in the zone right here by being perfectly quiet like this? Oh, that's amazing. Awesome. I don't want to have to end the presentation in a full whisper. But this is a true story from American history. It starts in 1803. In 1803, the United States of America was a completely different place than it is right now. It was only this big right here. That's it. This right here was the United States. That's it. That's all there was. This over here, France. This over here, Spain. Florida, also Spain. President, 1803, Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> there he is. Such a great president. In our country, this is too this is too small. It must be bigger. Everybody thought he was crazy. Look very closely. This is how much he wanted to expand it. Are you watching? That much right there. It's all over. It's all over. This town here was the city of New Orleans. So New Orleans was a very valuable city. It was the bottom of a very important river, the Mississippi. It flowed all the way across the country. If you were a farmer or a trapper or a lumberjack, you could put your stuff into a river boat. It would float down the river. You could sell it along the river, or even better, you could let it sell out into the ocean, and a big sailing ship would take it off to Europe and sell your goods in Europe. And they would bring back money for the trappers, the lumberjacks, everybody getting money. Here's the problem. France owned that port of New Orleans. They could charge every single boat coming or going a ton of money. The president in 1803 was like, I want that French money. <laughs> I want it so bad. How can we get our country to own New Orleans? Should we go to war with France? That seems like a terrible idea. What he did is he got a whole bunch of American taxpayer dollars, three million, he gave it to a little stick man. He says, all right, stick man, I'm sending you out to France. You are going to make a deal with the leader of France to buy the city of New Orleans for three million dollars. Little stick man. He wasn't really a stick man. This guy's name was James Monroe. If that sounds familiar, it's because he later became the president. Is that right, James Monroe? You little stick man. You're taking that $3 million off to France. You're going to make a deal. James Monroe said, what if they won't sell it for $3 million? I will have traveled all the way to France for nothing. The president said, all right, I probably shouldn't, but I'm going to send you a blank check. That blank check goes to $15 million. Start at three. If you have to, you can go all the way to 15. That is how much I want New Orleans. So James Monroe jumped in a ship and he sailed. Before we talk about France, we have to talk about the leader of France at that time. The leader of that France was a very interesting person. If you like history, you have to like this person. Whether you think he was good or evil, he had sideburns, teeny little mouth, gigantic hat. His name was Napoleon. Napoleon Bonaparte was the leader of France at that time. Napoleon was not just the leader of France. He was one of the greatest military minds who ever lived. Some historians say he's the greatest military mind that ever lived. What made him so good? Technology. He was not afraid of new technology. At that point, the new technology was artillery. 
and he would get his artillery teams to train with the best mathematicians and engineers, and they would go outside of the city that they wanted to attack. They would stand way back and they would shoot this artillery shells at the sea, just blasting the walls to bits. And only after they had softened up the city with perfect precision artillery fire would they send in the troops. The troops would take over the city and put up a big French flag. Da -da -da. The city now belongs to France. They were doing that all over the world. If you were to look at North and South America over here, remember they have this huge chunk right here, boom, France. Over here in Europe, oh, it's even crazier. Europe, there it is, there it is, there it is. They would march into a city and they say, boom, you are part of France, boom, you're part of France, boom, you're part of France, boom, France, France, France. Little tiny island in the Caribbean, boom, you're part of France, France, France. They were taking over. Napoleon looked at the world with all these French flags and he was like, uh, uh yeah. <laughs> This is all my stuff. Now, how well, how well do you think this little skip man is going to do against this guy? While we are waiting for a little skip man, James Monroe, to get to France, this is a long, month's long journey across the Atlantic, we are going to take a trip to, we are going to go to this tiny island in the Caribbean. Island changed American history. This tiny little island in the Caribbean was called San Domingue. San Domingue had long sandy beaches, rolling green jungly hills, and then steep, sharp mountains above the whole thing. This island deep in the Caribbean, San Domingue, grew two very special crops. They grew coffee beans, and they grew sugar cane. What made it special? Half the world's supply came from this island. Now imagine if you controlled half of the world's sugar and coffee trade. You are the richest. Think about it. People buy gold and silver once or twice in their life. They buy coffee and sugar every day. If you own this island, you are a money maker. The French owned this island. The French settlers came to check out this island. They said, let's do it. Let's harvest the sugar and the coffee bean. And they went onto this island. It sounds like a paradise, right? Out in the Caribbean, sugar, coffee. Well, in the 1800s, this island was a bad place. It was covered with mosquitoes. And those weren't uh, just any mosquitoes. These mosquitoes carried yellow fever. The French settlers would come to harvest the sugar and the coffee. They'd go into the jungles and start chopping things down. They'd get stung by a mosquito. The next day, their friends would look over, and they were dead. Next day, they'd look up, more people were dead. Next day, they'd look up, French settlers dead. Just French, dead French people everywhere. Dead, dead, dead. dead. The French really wanted that sugar and the coffee, though, so they did something terrible. There was so much money at stake that they did something awful. They said, we're not going to do this anymore. We're doing something terrible. We're bringing in slave ships loaded down with human slaves from Africa. And we will stand far back on the sandy beaches with our guns pointed at the slaves, and we will send them in to harvest the sugar and the coffee. And the slaves would come off of these boats, and they were no different than the French. They'd get stung by the mosquitoes, and they would die of the yellow fever, too. Behind that slave ship would be another slave ship loaded down with human cargo. And they would all go in, and they would all die of yellow fever. The French didn't care. They said, that's all right. As long as we get the sugar and coffee, we'll keep these slave ships to think about. The more this happened, though, the more something interesting happened. A person would get stung by a mosquito, and they'd wake up the next day, and they'd be like, ugh, I feel terrible. But I'm starting to feel better already. They'd now be immune to the yellow fever. In each slave ship that came, there would be a handful of people who had natural immunity to the mosquitoes. After a while, the population of these people grew and grew until you had a whole population of people on the island who had total immunity to the yellow fever. And they would spend all day chopping down sugar cane, gathering coffee. Do you know what you chop sugar cane down with? My favorite gardening tool, the machete. Machete. The best gardening tool because it looks like a sword. They would stand and say, hey, these machetes sure are good at chopping down sugar cane. I wonder if we could use a machete to, uh, I don't know, chop down that French guy with the gun over there. <laughs> and they ran over, they swung that machete, and this French guy's head went just flying through the air. What you know. They're like, oh, these work awesome. Let's cut off all the French people's head. And, all, all the French people's head. and they ran, and they hid out in the tops of these mountains. They said, oh, we're going to be in big trouble. But nobody came up there. So they said, okay, let's go get the guys on the other side of the island. Let's do it. They're chopping off all of their heads. <laughs> Things went back and forth. Things got real ugly on this island. The French wanted this money. The slaves wanted their freedom, and they went back and forth. Punishment for rebel slaves began to get worse and worse. One of the punishments I've read about, they would take a barrel, 
and they would pound nails through the barrel so that just a few inches of the nail stuck through. And then they would load the rebellious slave into the barrel and roll it down a hill. Can you imagine that? They were boiling people in sugar. They were boiling people. It was a horrible time. <laughs> These wars went on and on, the machetes, everything, people dying left and right. After a while, the sugar and the coffee stopped coming. Napoleon was furious. Napoleon's like, we have got to get this island back under control. So who did Napoleon, the greatest military mind of all time, send to the island of San Domingo to get back under control? He sent his sister, Pauline. Pauline Bonaparte was known for her beauty. She had lots of wonderful dresses and things. This was in the uh, Empire Wasteland time period, if you're a costume fan. <laughs> Somebody's a costume fan, I heard a laugh. She said, what, what are you and your husband doing? You're just hanging out, your husband's like clerk? All right, I'm sending you to get this island under control. The two of you, you're not doing anything. Pauline's like, okay, that sounds like fun. Uh, I actually have been wanting to build a castle. Can I build a castle on that island if we uh, get it under control? Pauline's like, yeah, go nuts. Just get it back under control. We were running out of money. I need my sugar and coffee money back. So these two went off to San Domingue, but they did not go alone. They went in these massive warships, loaded down with Napoleon's top troops. These weren't just any fresh new recruits. These were his veterans. These guys had been through wars all over Europe. They had smashed through city after city, fortress after fortress. They were the best. Their bayonets and everything were top of the line, high tech. They sailed to this island and they said, this is gonna be easy. We're gonna fight against an army. They don't even have training. It's not even a real army. It's a bunch of people with gardening tools. We're gonna wipe these guys out. How many soldiers did Napoleon send to this island? 30,000, a massive amount. These soldiers were like, this is gonna be a vacation and they stormed the beaches with all of their high-tech artillery, machines, everything drawn and ready to attack. All of those weapons and all of that training and all of that experience totally useless against mosquitoes. And the soldiers started dying by the thousands. The few that were strong enough to make it to the tops of these mountains were immediately cut down by a machete. And then the person would be like, look, in this end I have a machete, and in this end I have a brand new top of the line French musket. And this person's like, I got a whole artillery piece. And this guy's like, I got a whole warship. <laughs> His brother-in-law, Le Clerc, stung by a mosquito, dead of yellow fever. Napoleon's sister, Pauline, mm. stung by a mosquito, woke up the next day. The, the Bonapartes were fascinating people. She had natural immunity, and she's like, what's going on? Where are all the soldiers? And they're like, the soldiers are dead. She's like, well, where's my husband? And they're like, he's dead. <laughs> she's like, what are we going to do? Let's get out of here. And they're like, finally, there's only a few of us left. Let's pile onto a ship and sail out of here. And she's like, that's a good idea. But before we go, I promised my husband his heart would be buried in France. And they said, um, we're not going to take a disease-ridden corpse on the boat. And she said, I didn't say his body. Get a knife and cut his heart out. And they said, what are you going to do with it? And she said, I will put it in a silver cup and take it home to France. So they cut his heart out and put it in a silver cup. And that ship, last ship, sailed away from the island of San Domingue. And as Pauline looked out of the back of the ship, she saw all of the slaves cheering, for they were no longer slaves. The French flags came down, and they never went up again. These people had just completed the greatest slave uprising in world history. They renamed their part of the island to Haiti. Mm. And they never went back. There are two main revolutions in the New World. The first one was the American Revolution in the in, uh, 1770s. The second one was the Haitian Revolution in the 1800s. Second big revolution. Biggest slave revolt in world history. And they never went back under anybody's control. The people who live in Haiti today are the ancestors of those people who fought against the French. Pauline sailed back to France. She got to Napoleon's palace and was just like, where did you send me? Why would you send me to such an awful place? And he's like, because you were supposed to get my sugar and coffee back, you stupid girl. Oh, no. and she's like, my husband's heart is in a cup. <laughs> Napoleon was like, do you know what's in my cup? Not sugar or coffee. <laughs> She's like, did you hear the part about his heart? <laughs> and it was just, they started screaming at each other. <laughs> you ever heard two French people argue with each other? It gets very loud. <laughs> Into the big man. <laughs> stick man said, uh, excuse me, my name is James Monroe. I'm a stick man. I have $3 million. I would like to buy the city of New Orleans. And they're like, 
Who even lets you been here? <laughs> we are talking about important things. You have a bag of money? Where's New Orleans? And he said, you don't even know where it is and you own it? Well, here, here's a map of North and South America here. Uh, New Orleans is right here. They looked at the map, they saw New Orleans, and guess what's right across the water? The island of San Domingue. Napoleon is like, I hate that stupid island. It cost me 30,000 soldiers. She's like, you hate it. My husband's heart is in a cup. <laughs> How much do you want? Three million dollars for New Orleans? I'll tell you what, I hate the New World, I hate the mosquitoes, I hate everything. How about you just buy all of it? The little guy's like, uh, I didn't even know it was for sale. <laughs> the boy's like, make me an offer. The stick man's like, uh, I got 15 million. <laughs> the boy's like, uh, let me think about it. <laughs> Napoleon went and he took a bath. I don't want you guys to think I'm making this part up. This is a true story. This part is so weird, though. I have to remind you that it's a true story. Napoleon went and he sat in the bathtub. Got to draw his sideburns. I don't know if this is true or not, but I like to give him his hand. <laughs> Napoleon liked to bathe in rose water. He went and sat down in the bathtub. Finally, some peace and quiet. Sitting there daydreaming, should I sell it? $15 million is a lot of money, and I don't have my sugar and coffee money anymore. I could use it. What should I do? Suddenly, the door to his bathroom flew open. It was his two brothers, Joseph Bonaparte and Lucien Bonaparte. And they were like, is it true? Are you seriously thinking about selling off all of that property in North America? You've never been there. We've never been there. We just barely got that land from Spain. You're crazy. $15 million is nothing. It's so much land. You're a stupid person. You're a stupid brother. <laughs> what are you going to do? What are you going to do, Napoleon? And Napoleon, the greatest military mind in all of history, stood up out of the back. <laughs> he did. He did. He stood up and he just stared at <laughs> they said, what? what are you going to do, Napoleon? What are you going to do? And he just stared. They said, are you going to do it? Are you going to sell that land? You never talked to any of us. You're a terrible person. You know what Napoleon said? He said all over his sibling. They were standing there dripping their clothes, their hair, everything ruined. They pointed at him and they said, Napoleon, if you were not our brother, you would be our sworn enemy. They slammed the door. Napoleon smiled. He's <laughs> like, I'm gonna do it. And he sold us the Louisiana Purchase. Give Napoleon a hand, he did it, he sold us. The Louisiana Purchase, say, hey Thomas Jefferson, I'm back from France. Thomas Jefferson's like, oh, you were gone a long time. And he's like, I know, that was crazy. Well, did you get New Orleans? And the guy was like, you're not gonna believe this. <laughs> They sold us all of this. The president was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they really did. Now, people in Congress were actually furious. This is one of the greatest land deals in world history. But people in Congress, they can complain about anything. They're like, you are a stupid president. Why would you give Napoleon money? We have no idea if this will stay. This belonged to the Kingdom of Spain a few years ago. Besides. Napoleon's not an idiot. This might be useless land. Why would you buy such a thing? And he said, no, no, no. I think this is a great purchase. We have doubled the size of the country. I have hired a couple of explorers to go in there and check it out. These two explorers are named Lewis and Clark. Is that all right, Lewis and Clark? You are going to go in and explore this Louisiana purchase. Here are the things I want you to look for. Number one, I want you to look for a new river system, a northwest passage. If we can find a river that connects to the Pacific, we can send riverboats back and forth on it. We can make a ton of money. Second of all, this is a peaceful mission. I want you to make peace with the Native Americans who must live out here. We haven't met them yet, but I don't want any wars to happen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you with medals. On the cover of these, on the front of these medals, is a picture of me, Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> on the back of these silver medals are two people shaking hands. It says peace and friendship. You're going to hand these peace and friendship medals out to the Native Americans. And number three, I want to know what kind of weird animals they got out there. They might have like the giant worms. I don't know. And the tall body rabbits. I don't know. Giant bats. Who knows? I'm going to send you with a journal. You need to write them down. 
draw pictures of them, tell me all about them, because I love animals. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, we'll do it. We will do it. He said, yes, but you're not going by yourself. You're putting together a team. That team will be called the core of discovery. To be part of this team that explores America, you must be strong. You must be tough. But above all, you must be cool. <laughs> you do not want anybody who's going to fight with the Native Americans. Remember, this is a peaceful mission. We're going to have tryouts to make sure that people are strong and cool and tough enough to go exploring. All these guys showed up to go exploring Lewis and Clark. They said, we want to be it. This was a military operation, so most of these guys were soldiers. This guy's like, I'm a soldier. I got a musket. I'm ready to go. This guy's like, I got a rifle. I'm ready to go. This guy's like, I got a pistol. This guy's like, I got two pistols. <laughs> I got two pistols, and I got a musket, and I got a rifle, I got a shotgun, I got a bow and arrow, I got a crossbow, I got a sword, I got a spear, and I got a tomahawk. <laughs> this guy's like, uh, I got a shovel. <laughs> One guy showed up, and he was so big and strong, he didn't even need any weapon. He was just like, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> Also, there was a dog. A dog that joined the Corps of Discovery. A dog. Lewis and Clark said, look at this group. This is great. I like these guys. I like them. Let's, but this guy's going. This guy's going. This guy. I like this guy. Look at this guy. <laughs> guy with all the weapons. Are you going to share those weapons with the Corps of Discovery? And this guy was like, if you touch my weapons, I will kill you. <laughs> That, that is not cool at all. That's not cool. You are staying home. And uh, Shovel Guy, you're, you're not cool either. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> we're taking this guy, though, and we're going to take the dog. This, this guy, my favorite guy in the Corps of Discovery, his name was York. York was the only African American to go on the Corps of Discovery journey. Now, you guys know about American history. You know it's filled with terrible time periods. Well, York grew up during one of these time periods. He was a slave. He grew up in Captain Clark's house. In fact, they were the same age and they grew up together. Captain Clark said, York, you've grown up with me. I'm gonna go explore America, you're coming with me. York actually had no choice, he had to go. But once they got out into the wilderness, things changed. And York very quickly became the best hunter. And he'd be out hunting way ahead with his big long rifle, scouting ahead, seeing things before anybody else. So a lot of times we say Lewis and Clark discovered this, or Lewis and Clark discovered that. Really, it was this guy, York discover these things before anybody else. Lewis and Clark, when they'd go into a Native American village, they would get all dressed up. They had huge George Washington style hats. They would put their big hats on with the feathers on top. They had those Captain Crunch shoulder pad thingies. <laughs> all dressed up. They'd go into a Native American village. They wanted to look as impressive as possible. And they'd say, we are Lewis and Clark and we're here to give you this silver medal and we are now going to share the country between us. And the Native Americans would come out and they'd be like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh, -huh, uh -huh. oh. <laughs> Who's that guy? <laughs> so, uh, no, we, we are the important ones and we are the leaders. We are trying to give you this medal. Please take this medal. Like, oh, yeah, that's really, really nice medal. But, uh, Who's that guy? <laughs> <laughs> and say, please, please take this medal. And say, fine, fine, we'll take the medal. We gotta go talk to that guy. <laughs> and they would run out and the adults in the village would just grab onto his muscles and just be like, oh. <laughs> The children would grab onto York's legs and they'd just be like, oh. Who are you and where did you come from? What's your name? Your name is York? That's a terrible name. In our village, we're going to give you a way better name. In our village, we will call you the Buffalo Man. You've got curly hair like a buffalo. You're strong as a buffalo. Buffalo man, you got to stay with us forever. <laughs> because we love you. <laughs> and he's like, ah, oh, thanks for the offer, but i got to go explore America. Lewis and Clark, and they say, please. And nope, I've got to go. They say, fine, buffalo man, you can go, but before you go, we want that dog. No, no. Lewis and Clark had a Newfoundland dog. This was a great, if you haven't seen a Newfoundland dog, they're one of the biggest breeds of dogs. They are huge. I think it's third or fourth biggest. They're giant dogs. Cool thing about Newfoundland dogs, they've got webbed paws. This makes them swimmers. They're one of the best swimming dogs. If you were a sailor in the sailing days and you were on a ship, that ship's captain usually had a Newfoundland dog. They were such strong swimmers 
that if a sailor fell in the ocean, the dog could actually rescue him and take one of these Newfoundland dogs. They took it out into the wilderness, and the Native Americans of the plains lost their minds. They were like, where did you get that dog? <laughs> we have never seen a dog so big. They called this dog the bear dog. They said, please, please let us keep the dog. In fact, there was almost a war between Lewis and Clark and a village because the village did not want to let go of the dog. <laughs> but we haven't even left yet. Haven't even left yet. So they say, okay, Mr. President, we had our tryouts. We got 40 tough guys. We got a dog. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson was like, 40 tough guys and a dog. <laughs> Sounds pretty good. How many women? I said, women? This is a military operation. It's 1804. There are exactly zero women. Yeah. He's like, that's not fair. You need some women in this group. Yeah. They said, well, who would come with us? A bunch of the French trappers that they had hired. They'd hired a bunch of French trappers. They spoke up. They said, we know a woman that will come with us. She is married to one of our friends. Our friend is named Charbonneau. His wife was totally fit in with this group. You're going to love her. Her name is Otter Woman. This is what, wait, 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 wait. That's her name. Her first name is Otter, and her last name is Woman. <laughs> she sounds awesome. Mr. President, we got 40 tough guys. We got a dog, and now we got Otter Woman. <laughs> President's like, where is this Otter Woman? <laughs> said, oh yeah, French trappers, where's the Otter Woman? Said, oh, she's not here. She lives with Charbonneau, our friend, our trapper friend. They live in a Native American village. We'll just pick them up on the way. Said, okay, that's the plan. We got a woman for the group. What next? The president said, do you have a doctor? They said, no, no doctor. We just won't get hurt. That way we won't need a doctor. <laughs> the president's like, that is seriously the stupidest thing you ever <laughs> If you're not going to bring us, learn to be the doctor on this journey. I am sending you, Captain Lewis, Meriwether Lewis. That was his first name, Meriwether. I'm sending you to learn how to be a doctor. I'm sending you to my best doctor in America. He's my own personal doctor. He's a creepy little man. Wow. His name is Dr. Benjamin Rush. <laughs> Dr. Rush will teach you what you need to know to be the doctor. He goes to this guy's house. He's like, all right, Dr. Rush, what do I need? Dr. Rush says, first of all, you need a medicine chest, first aid kit. Here it is. I've prepared it for you. What sorts of operations would you like to learn today? Meriwether Lewis thought about it for a second and said, all right, uh, what if somebody breaks their arm? How do I cure that? Dr. Rush said, that's a tricky one. But I think you can handle it. The first thing you must do is find that break. You do that with your fingers. Just poke around until you feel a broken bone. Once you have located a broken bone, you need to go up about four inches and draw a big X. Now reach into the medicine chest. Inside the medicine chest, you will find a shiny new bone saw. You're going to the saw right on the X, carefully count to three, and then saw the arm off of the bone. They're always like, uh... Okay, nobody's allowed to break their arm on this journey. I don't, I don't want to do that, but Dr. Rush, what about a broken leg, though? Dr. Rush said, same thing, draw the X and saw the leg. <laughs> Are you sure? I really feel like a broken leg is bad, but a sawed off leg is like a thousand times worse. Dr. Rush was like, of course, I'm sure I'm the greatest doctor in America. I say, if they break their leg, saw it off. Mary Lewis got really quiet and said, Dr. Rush, what if they break their head? <laughs> do, 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 I have, do, do I have to saw their head off? <laughs> Dr. Rush was like, really? <laughs> You're that stupid. He said, what are you saying? Like, those guys kind of saw their arms and legs off. That doesn't seem very smart. <laughs> no. Don't saw their head. If you saw their head off, they will die. <laughs> if they've got a head injury, if they're feeling sick and they just can't go on, put away the bone saw. Get out the knife. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to take this knife, and you're going to cut deep, 
deep cuts into their body. This will cause blood to just shoot out. If enough blood shoots out, the disease will shoot out too. And if that doesn't work, I've got a jar filled with leeches. Just put the leeches all over the patient's body. And the patient will be super, super, super happy. <laughs> Always takes a second to get back on track after that. That's crazy stuff, right? Doesn't that sound insane? Yeah. It's hard to believe, but those are all real operations that would have happened hundreds of thousands of times in Dr. Rush's career. Doctors in those days probably would have finished the day by having their assistant clean all of the arms and legs that they had cut off out, throw them in the backyard or whatever they did with them, I don't know. I, every one of these operations, every one of these operations is a real operation. Aren't you glad you live in 2018? Mary Weather Lewis was like, thank you for that medicine lesson, Dr. Rush. I'm sure it will be very helpful. I will take the medicine kit, but I'm going to leave right now. I really hope I never see you again. And Dr. Rush was like, wait a minute. I haven't told you everything. <laughs> Ooh, my voice, my voice hurts, but I can make Dr. Rush really creepy on this. I like it. I like it. He says, I haven't told you everything. I haven't told you about my newest invention. I call them Dr. Rush's Bilious Pills. And he's like, uh, I know I'm gonna regret this, but uh, <laughs> what does bilious mean? <laughs> Dr. Rush said bilious means stomach fluid. These are stomach pills. If your stomach hurts, just take a bilious pill and you will feel better. And Mary one of those was like, what did you put in those pills, Dr. Rush? And Dr. Rush said, don't even worry about it. <laughs> he said, yes, but Dr. Rush, what will happen if I take one of those pills? And Dr. Rush said, just take one. <laughs> You'll find out. And he put the pills into the medicine chest, and the core of discovery finally took off on their journey. Now, the core of discovery, Lewis and Clark did not hike across America. When they set out, they set out on a giant river boat called a keel boat. It was 50 feet long, as long as this stretch of the library right here. All of these tough guys stood and rowed in this boat. They were rowing against the current. York, that big tough guy, would stand up at the very front. <laughs> he would guide them from running into the rocks and stuff. They had a sail that they could put up. Sometimes the wind would push them against the current. Lewis and Clark would stand on this raised platform back here, and they were drawing and they were mapping as hard and as quickly as they could. Remember, they were the first explorers in here, so they had to draw maps. So they were drawing maps for the next explorers. The big Newfoundland dog would stand on the back of the boat and just bark at things all day. <laughs> They had a uh, <coughs> fleet of scout canoes. They had two medium-sized scout boats called P-Rogues. These could take between four and six guys. They'd go on longer side trips. This is how they set off into the wilderness. Now, they'd been out for a couple of weeks when suddenly their French trappers jumped up very excited. They were waving their arms around. They said, what, what's going on, French guys? And they said, remember Otter Woman? Well, that's a village right over there. They said, oh, yeah. We forgot about Otter Woman. Go get her. They went into the village and they came out with the scraggliest old French trapper. And they brought him to the boat. They said, oh, hello, who are you? And he said, my name is Charbonneau. Other woman cannot come on this boat. They said, why not Charbonneau? And he said, because she's gone. She took off a couple of months ago and nobody knows where she went. But uh, don't worry, we can just take my other wife instead. He said, whoa, 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 Charbonneau, how many wives do you have? He said, I've got two. I've got Otter Woman and I've got this one. Let's take her instead. He said, well, do you want to come with us? And she spoke up. She said, yeah, I'll come with you. This sounds interesting. He said, well, what can you do? She said, well, I speak several Native American languages. I can be your translator. And I was born out west. I can be your guide. And I can hunt and I can fish and I can trap. And uh, is that your scout canoe right there? And they said, yeah. And she jumped into this thing grabbed a paddle, and just took up like 100 miles an hour. <laughs> she came back a second later. <laughs> Captain Clark was like, she is faster in that canoe than any of you guys. <laughs> Lady, you are hired. But what is your name? And she said, my name is Sacagawea. Sounds like a lot of you guys knew that. 
This is how we know the name of Sacagawea because she joined the Corps of Discovery. They said, Sacagawea, we are very excited to have you. And she stood up out of that boat and said, I'm happy to be here. They said, whoa, 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 whoa. Sacagawea, why is your belly sticking out? <laughs> she said, why do you think it's sticking out? I'm about to have a baby. They said, wait, you're going to come on a dangerous journey into the unknown and you're about to have a baby? And she's like, yeah, deal with it. <laughs> Okay, we will deal with it. This right here is our core of discovery. When you hear about Lewis and Clark, these are the people we're talking about. Now, I've been giving you a little bit of bad history. I've been making Sacagawea speak English. That's not true. Sacagawea never spoke English. I've been making Charbonneau speak English. That's not true either. In order to converse with these people, they'd have to line up rows of different translators to translate into French and English into uh, Sacagawea's language, Hidatsa all kinds of complicated stuff for this group to be able to communicate with each other. Keep in mind, in these days in the United States, once you crossed the Mississippi, there was no English. Mm -hmm. There was no, there was very little French to Charbonneau. There was a little bit of Spanish down at the very bottom of Texas and on the edge of the California coast. But everything else was Native American languages and they were very lucky to have Sacagawea <coughs> to translate for them. And thought, once they got out into the wilderness, they started seeing crazy new animals. Lewis and Clark looked out one day and they said, what? is that thing. It was a coyote. They were freaking out. Coyotes had not been seen on the East Coast before. They were like, well, look at that. What is that? Is it like an ugly fox? Is it a baby wolf? What is that? Get out the book. We got to draw a picture of it. They're very excited. Sacagawea came home. She's like, "What's the hold up, guys. What's the problem here? They said, Sacagawea, you're not going to believe it. We just discovered a brand new animal. She's like, what, that? You guys didn't discover that. That's a coyote. Native Americans discovered that like a million years ago. And they're like, no, uh -uh. we discovered it. She's like, no, you didn't. And they're like, yes, we did. Because we are going to draw pictures of it. We're going to write down its behavior. We're going to get samples of its fur. We're going to smell the coyote. And then we're going to taste the coyote. So I was like, why would you taste a coyote? They said, because it might be delicious. This is a new animal. This could be the best food animal since chicken. And we won't know until we barbecue this coyote. So I was like, you seriously do not want to barbecue a coyote. And they were like... Yes, we did. <laughs> they did. They barbecued the coyote. Another day they were going along and they saw an antelope. Lewis and Clark were like, look at that. It's a new species of deer. Draw a picture. Get the journal out and get the barbecue stuff out because we are cooking that. <laughs> One day they saw the strangest bird any of them had ever seen. The coward. Now, you guys have seen a pelican, you know what this bird looks like, but imagine how strange, how alien this bird would look if you had never seen one before. I bet York looked at this pelican and was like, that is the ugliest seagull I have ever seen. <laughs> Let's barbecue that on the seagull. They, they cooked him up. They cooked him up. Lewis and Clark, in their journals, recorded over 120 new species of animal that had never been seen by Western science before. They drew pictures of it, they wrote them down, and they barbecued almost all of them. <laughs> Somebody did the research, they looked up the numbers because they carefully cataloged everything that they hunted for food. Somebody did the math and discovered that the core of discovery often on this journey was eating nearly six pounds of meat per person per day. That's a lot of meat. You know the hamburger, the quarter pounder? Yeah. Well, take that quarter pound of meat off, and there you have one quarter pound. So you gotta eat four of those to get a pound, and you gotta eat 24 of those to eat as much meat as it was oh, wow. on a daily basis. It's a lot of meat. You cannot eat that much meat. If you do, something horrible will happen to your digestive system. Here is a simple picture of the digestive system. We got the stomach and the upper and lower intestine. Here's where the food goes in, and here's where the food goes out. No. Yeah. You guys know how it works. Oh, yeah. You guys are good. You guys are good. When you eat a whole bunch of meat, it goes into your stomach in a big, solid block. Now, your stomach is totally capable of digesting that much meat. 
but it helps your stomach if you eat fruits and vegetables, fiber, all of these things go into your stomach to break this down. Once it all gets broken down, it can all go out nice and easy. The barbecue, it was just wham, block of meat, followed by wham, another block of meat, antelope meat, coyote meat, prairie dog meat, pelican meat. Then they got to the buffalo, and that was the real problem. They were having buffalo meat. Every day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. What's for lunch? Buffalo meat. What's for breakfast? Buffalo meat. What's for dinner? Buffalo meat. Meat, 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 meat. No fruits, no vegetables. After a while, their stomach became a jam of hard, impossible to digest meat. They got hungry. They could squeeze more food in. But after a while, they couldn't squeeze anything out. And their stomachs began to swell out, distended in pain. It couldn't go to the bathroom. To make it completely clear, the core of discovery became the core of constipation. <laughs> they did. They did. They would get into their camp at night and they would lay on the ground in severe pain. Their bellies just sticking up like this. <laughs> oh, here's Mary Weather Lewis. Here's William Clark back here. Oh, oh. Here's York back here. Oh, no, York. Oh, no. Oh, no. Look. Look at this. He's still got that six pack, though. Yeah. At this point, they all match with Sacagawea, right? Here's Sacagawea. Here's Mary Weather Lewis. Right? <laughs> Sacagawea's like, hey, Mary Weather, when's your baby due? Huh? Exactly, that's not funny. Our stomachs are in a lot of pain. She said, yeah, because you only eat meat. You should eat these roots that I dig up to eat. He's like, why would we eat roots? We've got delicious barbecue. She said, well, that's why your stomach hurts. She said, you want to know why my stomach hurts? He said, why? Just because I'm going to have a baby right now. And he's like, uh, good luck with that. I'm going to go over here. She's like, no, 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 no. You're the doctor. You're going to help me. And he said, yes, but Benjamin Rush did not teach me about that. She said, too bad. You're going to help me deliver this baby. Fortunately, at that point, they were staying in a little fort. They kicked everybody out of the fort, built a big fire, got all the blankets. It was a very difficult delivery, but in the morning, Second Julia stepped out of that fort. I like to imagine her all wrapped up in a buffalo robe. This would have been winter time. She stepped out in that buffalo robe, and everybody gathered around very respectfully and said, Secretary, is everything okay? She opened the robe to reveal a smiling baby boy. And everybody gathered around and they said, does, that, does this mean there's a baby in the core of discovery? And she said, yes, it does. There is a baby in the core of discovery. She said, hey, Secretary, what are we going to name that little guy? Before she could say anything, that French guy jumped out and said, we're going to name this baby after me. <laughs> My name is Toussaint Charbonneau. We are going to name this baby Jean-Baptiste Charbonneau. Secretary, I was like, Charbonneau, we won't. <laughs> <laughs> she, she did not 